thanks for being on the Quillette podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. So I'm just going to start off reading this highly controversial text you have at the beginning. Now and forever, employers should advertise jobs to applicants of all races and ethnicities, afford everyone an equal opportunity to be hired and promoted, manage workplaces free of discrimination, and foster company cultures where everyone is treated with dignity. Are you old enough to remember when this kind of language was progressive speak as opposed to, I don't know how you identify politically, maybe like a heterodox liberal or a disaffected conservative, but when did this become kind of... I don't know, risque to say in progressive circles. You know, pretty recently, I think, um, I wouldn't have thought that saying that and merely that was at all controversial as recently as, say, 2012, 13, 14. I don't know exactly when the crossover is, but I would have thought of a statement like that as a kind of extra signaling that we are open to everyone for the first jobs that I had in my career. I graduated from college around 2002. You're old enough to remember the Great Awakening, which I guess is kind of what we're describing. Uh, mm -hmm. And this isn't what you've written here in The Atlantic isn't really like a conservative screed. For instance, you have this paragraph fairly early up where you give a, ver a very eloquent description of the circumstances surrounding the murder of George Floyd. And you talk about how this was a guy trying to turn his life around. And actually, you mentioned some details that I didn't quite know about in terms of, of George Floyd. But in so doing, you also touch on some of the many, many ways that I guess what is called systemic racism is baked into American life. There is a grain of truth to the idea that to be strictly colorblind doesn't really get at the whole truth of American race, right? I want to be careful here because um, there are certainly straight lines you can draw from, you know, you can imagine a descendant of American slaves who is black having had their grandparents um, suffer under Jim Crow, having their property seized, not being able to pass that property down to the next generation. Uh, I think that, you know, because of the nature of Jim Crow, um, of course, that is going to affect black descendants of American slaves in a particular way. Um, I don't know if that's the case for George Floyd in particular. Um, one of the things that's been dizzying for me in this kind of moment of quickly changing social mores and politics and ideology is that I'm a pretty libertarian leaning person. And early in my career, long before Black Lives Matter came along, I was writing about police abuses, about the need for police reform in a way that people might associate with, uh, you know, pretty in line with what you'd find at Reason Magazine, let's say. The libertarian. And, yeah, from a libertarian perspective. And, and in doing that, um, I saw plenty of egregious instances of police abuses and violence against Black people. Uh, but also plenty of instances of egregious police abuses against white people. Um, I, you know, it's true statistically that black people are killed by police at higher rates. Um, at, at the same time, some of the most egregious police killings that I've seen have been of white people. I forget the guy's name, but I wrote an article about a guy who was killed by police while he was crawling down a hallway in a hotel room in Arizona um, it was horrific. And you now I wrote about another case in Waco where there was a big kind of crossfire mass shooting, lots of people pulling out guns and firing at a wake at a, a biker rally. Um, and it turned out that a lot of the bullets that were fired and killed people were fired by police who seemed to have really messed up the whole situation and, and messed up a bunch of the mass arrests and prosecutions too. Uh, so um, when it comes to police abuses, I often think that um, lots of solutions that could be described as colorblind would be perfectly adequate to the problem and would disproportionately help um, Black people insofar as they're disproportionately the victims of police abuses. Um, but But it seems... Plausible to me both that there is racism in policing. I'm sure that we could find some racist police officers out there and um, and we ought to try and weed them out. But also that, um, you know, 
a, a lot of the uh, problems in policing um you know aren't necessarily rooted in racism or ideological certainly ideological white supremacy and that uh, we we got to be open minded when we're looking for solutions about uh, what the right levers are to press to do something like reduce police killings or reduce unjust police killings where this article that you've written in Atlantic is concerned the discussion about uh, police behavior is a little bit of a, of a tangent because police behavior is something that affects uh, all sorts of communities, mm -hmm. especially exactly, yeah. for, for reasons discussed, uh, especially black communities disproportionately uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas some of the things you talk about in your article are much more uh, esoteric and maybe are of um, more interest to, to upper middle class people um, who don't confront racism on an everyday basis. Although before we proceed further, there, there's an interesting passage here in your article. Uh, you <laughs> you name drop uh, Robin D'Angelo, who, as I understand, is actually a white person. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, she's become a figure of infamy in conservative circles because she takes a, a maximalist understanding of how much white supremacy there is in America. But she also talks a lot about white fragility. And this is something we should talk about because... I think for the last few years, at least, there has been this unanswerable uh, retort to anybody talking about these issues, which is, I mean, people who are watching this on video are going to look at the screens, two white guys uh, exhibiting maybe what they call white fragility. Uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, the effect that that has on the debate. But I'm also interested, if you feel comfortable, talking about the editorial decision here. The Atlantic is sort of a mixed bag editorially, but it does make some what I consider brave editorial decisions. In this case, I expected that an article like this wouldn't be written or at least published by somebody who looks like you. Maybe this kind of article is easier to publish if it's written by somebody who is more diverse. You know, I've been at the Atlantic, I forget exactly how long, more than 10 years at this point, and I've was attracted to the magazine to begin with uh, because it felt like one of the few places where I could come down where I thought on different issues. Most places wouldn't have published this article. So props to The Atlantic for publishing this. John McCorder, who was at The Atlantic for a while, uh, is now at The New York Times. I can imagine him He's publishing this. Yeah, you and he are um, very different people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but... Um, you know, if Ross Douthat would have written this at the Times, would they have refused to publish it? I wouldn't presume that. Um, That's fair. That's fair. I I think that um, certainly there are places that that might have looked askance at it. I don't know that Vox would have published this, um, but uh, you know, I'm not 100 percent sure that that they wouldn't have either. Uh, but but it is striking to me that we're even having the conversation, and we're a bit uncertain about who might and might not publish it because. Uh, I don't see the piece as having made any uh, claims that are at all out of the mainstream for members of any race. I don't think that there's any racial or demographic group in America where um, you would find uh, a majority of people saying, no, that's totally unreasonable. I oh, think you I would completely find agree, dis but... disagreement on every... Um, but you know you that know. that's not the criteria that a lot of newsrooms use it's kind of like a tribal thing like is this is this guy on the right side of history is this guy on the wrong side of history and especially after the george floyd george floyd moment that was a lot of the way this kind of issue was discussed and to and me have... the the post george floyd moment is obviously it's about this constellation of race and identity and and the great awakening and and we understand it in the context of these things uh, but I also understand that as well as Me Too um, in the context of having been old enough to see the United States right after 9-11 and this other kind of exogenous shock that frightened people, that outraged people. They said this is a terrible thing or a, a depravity and injustice, whatever the case may be, that caused a kind of uh, rallying around and groupthink and a discomfort with making certain kinds of arguments that in hindsight um, – we wish we would have made a bit more of more skepticism of, uh, you know, something like the Iraq war or even the panic that 
you know, is totally gone now around something like how oh, Sharia law is going to take over the right. United States. Right. It's amazing that even in this populist right moment in the Republican Party, it's just totally non-existent. No one talks about it anymore at all. And so I, I guess I've been around enough of these moments in media, some really pronounced like post 9-11 and others smaller, where there is a kind of hard to define shift in what the public is ready to hear, what publications are uh, ready to publish, what feels brave and what feels heterodox and what's common sense. Um, I, I tend to see this in the context of those other things and not a, a unique um, identity politics thing. By the way, this is a tangent, but your comment about how <laughs> Sharia law was was right, right around the corner and we were going to wake up the next day and we were all going to have to uh, put our, our women in kneecaps and, and that sort of thing. That wasn't so long ago. I mean, I, I remember that being as, you know, maybe two decades, 15 years ago. What's interesting I, here in Canada, I don't know if it's the same in the United States, you're starting to see conservatives and traditional uh, Islamic faith communities make common cause a little bit because in some cases, the the Islamic faith communities are the only people pushing back hard on some of the, the gender stuff. Uh, in a, in a way that I think would have been unimaginable right after 9-11. Uh, so these right. things these things do work in cycles. Uh, right. You have an interesting reference here. Not sure I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Uh, racial equity consultant Tima Okun. But she originally talked about how things like a sense of urgency and beliefs, including individualism, are traits of white supremacy culture, and not to to pick on this particular person, because I've seen that a lot in some of the materials that you see in Canadian schools, where they talk about how perfectionism is a white trait, or um, the need for high achievement, and and you read it, and there's a kind of like racism baked into it, where a lot of the qualities we associate with, you know, high performing professional and academic culture are dismissed as this artifact of white supremacy. On, on some of the doctrinaire fringes of the DEI movement that you discuss, is there a kind of weird progressive racism that's baked in? That The way I would put it is that there's extreme racial essentialism and stereotyping. And so, you know, we could quibble over whether that's racism or not, but that's more particularly what I think it is. And it... Um, it, it too dovetails with some of the debates about gender going on now, where you see a divide among progressives, some of whom are defining um, man and woman in ways that are more tied to um, stereotypes about what those things are right. than progressives would have 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Um it's been astonishing to me this this Timo Kuhn material that Matt Iglesias actually wrote a very uh, good post on this on his Substack. Uh, it, the title might have been "The Work of Timo Kuhn is Really Bad" or something like that. But um, what, what's astonishing to me, uh, I, I wouldn't you know single this person out uh, if it were just a random piece of uh, internet arcania out there that someone said that even some DEI consultant said. Uh, it's astonishing how far this material has spread. It, it was uh, infamously part of this big Smithsonian webpage and exhibit for a while right. and, and, yeah. and upset a lot of people then, reached a lot of people then. Um, in the slide decks that different people send me from different corporations and institutions of higher education, I see it popping up again and again. And it's difficult to find someone who will defend it when you press people right. and you say – you know, wait, do you really believe this? What's the grounding for this? As you saw from her quote in my piece, um, it's not based in any scholarship. It just, as she described, it just came into her mind one day. And um, to me, it's a kind of quintessential example of the lack of rigor that informs a lot of these DEI presentations and trainings and curriculum, where it's quite confusing to try and trace it back and to, to try and even argue with it because it's like, wh where is it coming from? It's just these uh, stories that seem intuitively true to a small number of people. And um, so it's, I really find it quite confusing how these things um, spread so far and so fast. Well, the, the second half of your piece in Atlantic especially uh, has a 
a thumbnail thumbnail summary of some of the the actual uh, maybe more rigorous uh, controlled studies that have been done on diversity training. And you cite one uh, published in 2012 called Diversity Training Doesn't Work. Uh, and that was published in Harvard Business Review. I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering whether this could be published today, uh, although it sounds like quite rigorously uh, documented here. Uh, is it really true that the researchers found no positive effects in the average workplace for diversity training? I forget. I'd have to go back and, and look at their article to look at the different, you know, potential positive effects that they looked at. This is another problem with the whole industry is there's often a reluctance to even say what the positive effects might be because that's, then you would have to measure effect. them. And yeah. um, But after, uh, after Donald Trump was nominated and elected, like a lot of journalists, I began hunting around for some explanation of this unexpected uh, thing in the American system that everybody thought was not going to happen until it did. And I um, I think it was through Jonathan Haidt. Um, he tweeted out a link to a s political psychologist named Karen Stenner and said, in my estimation, Karen Stenner's work is the best kind of explanation for what's going on here with this uprising of the populist right. And so I dig into Karen Stenner's work. It turns out to be a really fascinating book about um, the authoritarian personality type. And right. she describes this as a latent predisposition toward authoritarianism um, that is in fact latent in most people at most times, but that can be triggered by various things. And, and then it's not latent. And then you, when it's not latent, you have these two tribes of people, the authoritarians who in her terms want to enforce oneness and sameness and the libertarians, um, not in the political ideological sense, but defined as people who are comfortable and even excited by difference. Um, one of the things that seems to trigger latent predisposition to authoritarianism is uh, exposure to difference and thinking of someone as an other. And in Stenner's work and in other research literature on authoritarianism, it makes the point that what we consider an other is actually pretty malleable. And so the famous kind of shorthand, there's a little bit of experimental work to suggest that if you tell people that there have been hostile aliens discovered, then they will be um, a bit less likely to be prejudiced against people of other races and religions because they've reframed what other is and humans are now more part of us. All humans are part of us and the aliens are them, right? It, it, it seems to me that, um, you know, Having read this literature for other purposes, I often think of it in in the uh, realm of diversity training because diversity training raises the salience of race, of gender, of whatever attribute it is that you're talking about in this training session with all your coworkers. And I think that the people who advocate for this kind of training are generally um, excited by or are favorably disposed to diversity. And they imagine that they have the same psychology as everyone else, where if you tell people you teach them more about these other people who are different, uh, that everybody will get along better. Uh, but in fact, this 15% of the people who have a latent predisposition to authoritarianism, if you raise the degree to which they think whatever other group of people is an other, is a them and not an us, um, they'll be less comfortable themselves and more hostile to those people. They will not be friendlier to those people. Um, you know, if, if journalists understood this insight, then when refugees came from uh, Afghanistan, say, and moved into a small town in the United States or Canada, the local newspaper reporter who wants them to be accepted, instead of going out and writing an article about how oh, their food is so different than anything I've ever had and other oh, music is so uh, atonal and interesting and, and aren't there all these unique differences, instead they would write a story that said, uh, I went and I ate with these people, and even though their dress is different and their customs are different, it turns out at the end of the day, they love their kids just like yeah. we do, and they want to get them an education. That was the most important thing, and we have so much in common as humans, right? These are both true stories. One emphasizes sameness, and one emphasizes difference. Uh, to me, the authoritarian literature uh, convinces me that at least for you know 10 to 15% of the population, 
emphasizing sameness would reduce prejudice and intergroup conflict a lot more than emphasizing difference. I don't say that as a moral statement. I just think that like that is what is for this subset of people. And so, you know, maybe if you're um, at Apple or Google, you've self-selected for a bunch of people who are relatively open to diversity and difference anyway, and your trainings are going to reach those people. Uh, I don't know. I, maybe there are a whole bunch of left-leaning authoritarians at those places. I'm not actually sure. But um, but if we're talking about a kind of economy-wide um, intervention, you know, if we're going to do a training that everyone at the company 3M, including all of the factory workers, are going to go through, if we're going to talk about something that we're rolling out to all of America, it seems to me that emphasizing um, – the salience of race as an important factor in who someone is and singling out people who are of a different race or ethnicity or national origin or sexual orientation and saying, these people are importantly different and it's imperative that you treat them differently. I don't think that's going to work out very well in a lot of cases. And I don't understand why the proponents of these trainings don't um, don't ever grapple with that. Uh, or this kind of research literature at all, other than that they um, they think that diversity is a good themselves and they just over assume that other people's psychology works like theirs does. Uh, well, I think there's a charitable premise embedded in your analysis there, which is that um, they're thinking at all about the effects of these things. Um, one of the things you've seen, and I, th I think you've seen in the United States, but it's also in other countries, including Canada, is that some of the most aggressive DEI regimes inside of institutions are institutions that are like art house, you know, ballet companies, um, museums here in, in, in Canada. We've, we've had a, a few uh, crazy stories coming out of museums uh, or it's like the medieval studies program at, I don't know, Smith College. It's places where the people of any skin color who are there probably have very little exposure to, to some of the, the real elements of racism that exist in every society because they live privileged lives. My sense from doing a lot of stories in this area is that because of that fact, the people in this industry understand how much privilege they have and are also eager to take these like self-valorizing steps that show that they're eager participants in this war that's going on for racial equity. And because they're in such privileged milieus, <laughs> they have to use these some, you know, absurdly over-torqued and highly symbolic methods, social media, slogan campaigns, posters, um, over-the-top hiring programs. But the real focus is kind of to peacock their own views. You know, I actually think that there's a kind of bridge between my relatively charitable explanation of motives and, and, and yours less so, because I don't entirely disagree. I, I guess I would say that I also do think that there's a lot of people advocating for these trainings and even doing these trainings that are um, earnest in their advocacy and think it's going to make the world a better place. Uh, but what I would say is that one of the problems with the approach that they take is that it is um, it, they're they're operating with a set of ideas that are pretty vulnerable to being manipulated by um, by bad actors. And what I mean by bad actors is actually a couple of different things. Uh, one by people who are, you know, as you put it, peacocking, who are, virtue signaling who are um who are in it to kind of self-aggrandize more than uh, anything else and i do think that there are some of those people i don't think it's a majority of people but uh even a few of those people can really distort a culture because there's a backlash to them then there's confusion about what the backlash is to exactly um and then I think that there are some people who abuse these moments to to grab power, to get rid of the coworker that they don't like for other reasons, to uh, try and advance their careers in a kind of mercenary way. And again, I don't actually think that that is most of the people who are advocating for these things. Uh, I, I just think that um, 
it is a mode that doesn't have very many safeguards against these kinds of things. Um, and I would say that my my relatively charitable view of the people who are for this is informed partly by talking to a bunch of people who do diversity trainings for a living and hearing um, how critical many of them are about their own industry. And more so and more often in private conversations than on the record, uh, I, I spent a long time trying to figure out, you know, with various people willing to talk to me in private and not willing to talk to me publicly, like how am I going to tell this story? And finally, I realized actually there's now enough on the record of people within the industry saying, yeah, this is often bullshit. We don't want to get rid of it entirely. We think there's a better way, but, and, and you know, you can look around the web and find this very easily. There was a, um, I was just watching a debate between uh, Heather McDonald and oh, someone else, I can't remember who was on her side, and then two DEI consultants or former DEI administrators. And it was a debate about whether you should just abolish DEI bureaucracies on college campuses. And what was striking to me is that the people who said don't abolish them, uh, keep them, improve them, themselves thought that they were utterly broken now. And couldn't defend the status quo, but but thought it wasn't worth you know throwing out the baby with the bathwater or something like that. Um, but um, you'll find a bunch of people within this industry, and, and you know part of it is like they're all competing in, in some sense for business, and it's like oh well yes the approach that everyone else is taking is bad, but like I've got the skeleton key, and you want to do my approach, um, but. Uh, it, it really is the case that there's a lot of kind of sound criticism from these people. And then, as I also say in the article, um, you know, some things that come under the DEI umbrella, um, I think, are utterly defensible. I say that I don't think that it makes sense to never, ever hire a diversity consultant ever, by which I mean um, some country, some companies uh, racially discriminate for years if they find that they've been doing that and that their hiring procedures are all messed up and they bring someone in who is an expert in um, you know, reviewing resumes, having fair interviews, whatever it is, fine. If they find that they're losing um, black employees at a much higher rate than anything else, you know, maybe that's because other companies are uh, recruiting black employees in this post-George Floyd moment. Maybe it's because when they look at the exit interviews, it seems like there actually is some... Uh, you know, even unintentional um, antagonism to black employees, right? And so if you bring in a consultant who specializes in retention because you want to retain talent at your company, um, could that come under the DEI umbrella? Sure. Uh, it, it's part of the maddening thing about this conversation is that this bundle of three goods, it, it's its a decision in itself to bundle them together. They're all hazily defined. They encompass things that almost everyone would agree to and other things that almost no one wants. Mm. And um, so that's, that's as far as we can talk about it with particularity, I, I think it's much better. It's an interesting description of it. Uh, it's a combination of things that are so commonly sought after that they're banal, just juxtaposed with things that are so obscure and weird that it's hard to find anybody who actually can defend them. Uh, although, as you alluded to, there are some leftists, maybe even self-described socialists, who, who who very much express these views. I'm thinking of Catherine Liu, uh, who has written a book describing how some of these ideas we're describing have essentially become a strategy for wealthy people, basically a socially acceptable ideological template for the managerial for the existing managerial class to reassert its moral authority over the workplace uh mm -hmm. you know so here in canada for instance it's it's not uncommon university uh, diversity uh, vice president might make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year uh at a time when adjunct professors are getting paid peanuts uh you know by traditional class analysis it's very difficult to sustain that difference until you say, well, this person is a enlightened prophet of diversity and inclusion and equity. So how else are we going to solve these existential problems? Uh, have you interviewed people who, who use a traditional socialist class-based form of analysis to address this issue? Yes. Um, you know, this debate actually that I was just um, 
talking about involving uh, Heather McDonald. She was the only one I was familiar with. By the way, by coincidence, she was our last guest on the podcast. Very much not a socialist. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. um, but Heather McDonald, as well as someone on the other side of the debate, found themselves in agreement that there ought to be um, particular affirmative efforts to help descendants of African-American slaves in the United States. This was a position that they both took, not exactly a, a Marxist or class analysis, but nevertheless, a kind of um, progressive uh, in some ways, not that Heather McDonald is at all progressive, um, but a critique that many on the left um, would recognize as left coded, let's say. And and yes, there there are these class critiques, um, you know that that also apply to the consulting industry generally. I should say that 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 this is somehow all bullshit and uh, and anti worker, and you should just pay the workers more. I'm not totally unsympathetic to it. Most people are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which um, you know he didn't. I don't think make a pyramid out of it, but but it's generally represented as a pyramid, and at the bottom. There's things like air and food. And until you've met those needs for air and food and water, you can't, according to this theory, meet any other needs. And then you go a level up and it's things like safety and shelter. And you level up once more and it's uh, family and friends and uh, companionship. And then you level up once more and you're at, I think, self-esteem or something like that. And, uh, and then the top of the pyramid, you're looking for self-actualization. And I'm struck by how much of what goes under the banner of social justice is now in that self-esteem to self-actualization right. tier. Yeah. The idea that everyone should feel a sense of belonging at work and that they can bring their whole selves to work, for example. And, you know, uh, I have mixed feelings about this. It's certainly, I hope all of my colleagues have that. If I ran a company as a CEO, I would want my employees to have that. And so I'm not discounting it. And I'm not saying insofar as there are reasonable steps that can be taken to facilitate that, they shouldn't be taken. But when we're talking in broad strokes about the need for social justice, the need to have a reckoning with America's past, it's just striking to me that uh, there's a lot of people at the bottom of that pyramid who are struggling to meet the very basic needs of life. And shouldn't our efforts to improve the world um, be mostly directed at those people uh, and not creating multi-billion dollar industries uh, to facilitate uh, people who are already very privileged, um, you know, self-actualizing in essence. And when I read uh, statements from people selling diversity training and they invoke George Floyd's name, and then they say, and because of this terrible tragedy, you need to bring me to your company and I will help you retain more employees by getting rid of uh, microaggressions and making everyone feel that they belong. I can't help but think, okay, impoverished man on one hand, um, people suffering uh, unintentional slights occasionally on the other. The selling point on this thing is often you can retain talent and increase profits. The other thing that's interesting about it is you hit it glancingly in your article, this this business about bringing your whole self to work, which is, is absolutely not what they actually mean. No, uh, no, it's it's you know, totally disingenuous, I think, or, or at least uh, they haven't thought it through. I mean, uh, you know, no one wanted James Damore to bring his whole self to work at Google, as we or, saw. Or I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm in Canada, so a hockey example, uh, you know, they... They had this event a couple of months ago where NHL hockey players were going to skate around the ice wearing these, you know, rainbow themed pride jerseys, which, okay, it's a nice thought. Um, uh -huh. There are a couple of Russian born religious Russian Orthodox players who are like, oh, I'm strapping on my skates and bringing my whole self to work today. And uh, I'm not going to wear that shirt. <laughs> Some of the same people who are advocating for bringing your whole self to work, what they mean is bring your whole self to work through the prism of what we imagine to be sort of officially sanctioned indicators of diversity. Any company, if it was being honest, would say that there are all sorts of ways one could bring their whole self to work, that the HR department will come down on you pretty hard and pretty And quickly. rightly so. I mean, if I bring my yes. whole self to yes. work yes. and start talking about sexual fantasies or something, people are like, we absolutely do not want that part of your whole <laughs> self at work. Yes, I agree. And rightly so. Yeah. Um, so, um, 
so yeah, I, I, I think, but I think the bring our whole stuff to work and the, also we need to have an honest conversation about, um, race in America. They are both statements, uh, made by, uh, this industry that are not in fact true. Um, there are lots of views about race that they do not want employees to air at work. There are lots of kinds of being yourself that they don't want people to be. <laughs> and I think that they should be honest about that instead of, um, yeah, instead of this kind of game of pretend. I never urge people to bring their whole selves to this podcast because uh, it would be horrifying. Uh, <laughs> one thing that's interesting about the diversity consulting industry is that when I talk to people who are like in the, say, construction industry, I'm thinking of some somebody in particular who's very knowledgeable about that, they will tell me that the training they get isn't like this training that we're talking about with like Robin D'Angelo and stuff. It's more like very basic stuff about, look, don't tell sexist jokes. Um, you know, if somebody talks with a lisp, don't make stupid gay references. You know, treat handicapped people with respect. Um, and, and I'll say, well, okay, do they teach you any of this stuff about like white supremacy? And, and often they'll say, no, they don't. Like, is it possible that you and I are, are in our own little bubble where a lot of the examples we're talking about are from things like universities? and high concept NGOs, because, you know, those are the kind of examples that like Christopher Rufo talks about, um, where it's, but but 90% of the population that works at Quickie Mart or not a stereotype, but, but people who aren't in these rarefied sectors, maybe mm -hmm. the DEI industry there is not going to the, this kind of excess. And maybe it's it's talking about practical stuff that really does good. Like I, I personally have heard from people in the DEI industry who say like my clients are like truck drivers and we're basically trying to teach them, you know, how to talk to women without offending them. <laughs> um, and, and, and I don't really recognize this discourse you're talking about with white supremacy that we don't talk about that at all. As I'm thinking of one yeah. guy in particular, like all of his drivers are Sikh. And if he started mm -hmm. telling them about white supremacy in the truck industry, they'd look at him like he was from outer space. First, it's just a huge industry, a huge uh, country. Uh, the United States is a huge country. Canada is a big country. Um, thank you. Thank you so, for saying that. It's very patronizing, but thank you for adding that. So, <laughs> so, so there, we're a little country. We're a little country. I admit it. Um, so there are um, this is, there are all kinds of things that that go on. Some of which are much more reasonable than others. Uh, I would say that there is a kind of diversity training that I think is a bit older than, you know, what we saw explode in the post George Floyd moment that, um, that mirrors the kind of sexual harassment training that many people have taken when they go to their jobs, which is to say, it's fundamentally oriented around saying, this is the law. Um, this is the concept of hostile workplace that is in the law. We as a company do not want to have a hostile workplace. But it's that also, don't sued. be a dick. I, I say yeah. that ninety percent of useful workplace training, whether you call it DI or otherwise, is is don't be a dick. And part of yeah. being a dick is telling racist jokes. Uh, the only caveat I would have is that, insofar as these things are common sense, they're often done by the existing HR um, apparatus of a company, or it's you know they've bought some video from an outside vendor or some computer thing or whatever, and it's um. It's very straightforward. It's not like this mystical, we need to bring in a right. special consultant to do better. And there's this body of secret knowledge and terminology that we all have to learn, right? It's not hidden priestly knowledge. Insofar as a company is saying, look, uh, we hear you're telling, uh, you know, we, we hear you're using racial slurs. We hear you're um, making fun of uh, the food that some ethnic minority group brings to lunch, Right. Uh, I think that's a perfectly fine, um, just as I think that it's perfectly fine for a company to uh, target any kind of assholery that is going on among their employees and say, stop being jerks. Uh, yeah, no, I think that that's fine. And I don't think that anyone um, who is on either side of this controversy actually objects to that kind of very basic common sense stuff. It's it's invariably, you know, even when you see kind of hardcore activists like Chris Rufo um, it, it, or like libs of TikTok, right? It's not like if there was a diversity consultant saying, and stop calling people the N-word, like you wouldn't find that on Chris Rufo's feed. You wouldn't find that on a libs of TikTok feed. I don't think anyone objects to that. 
one last question, and this goes to your your status as an Atlantic staffer. And, uh, you know, in my mind that you go to work, you're hanging around the water cooler at the Atlantic, using the microwave, playing foosball, you know, telling jokes. You also have to occasionally take uh, DEI training. And I know this because it's in your article, uh, although it's for new hires. So presumably you've been grandfathered in. Yeah, I should say that that um, an editor flagged that and said, oh, we should disclose this. But because it's for, for new it, hires, I wasn't aware of it. So yeah. It, it, yeah. it the, it's in parentheses and the whole the whole sentence reeks of an editor flag that, which is fine. That's what editors are for. Are for oh, yeah. You know? No, I'm glad that they it, did. Yeah. You don't want to say, oh, well, you know what a hypocrite. The Atlantic itself has DEI training like that's it's important to, to note stuff like that. However, uh, it could be the case that in the future you will be um, I don't know. I want to say it's disciplinary, but you know, maybe periodically there's going to be DEI training for veteran Atlantic workers. Did you think that when you were writing this, maybe in five or ten years, you'd have to take like you know some some course at the Atlantic, and the people in the course would be looking around the room, and you would have already expressed skepticism about it, so it might make it awkward. Uh, no, I'm not really worried about that hypothetical. I mean, I, I would actually. Um... Because I thought that's the first thing I thought about is like, you oh know, my God, very, it's going to be so awkward. I'm actually very curious about these courses. And so like, uh, you know, I've consumed many of them that I did not have to for okay. intellectual <laughs> and reporting purposes. Yeah. I've probably seen more than just about like anyone right. in America other than maybe DEI consultants themselves. But, um, but you know, I, I guess my personal attitude toward these things is kind of uh, twofold. On one hand, in theory, uh, I bristle against the idea that any um, th that anyone at a workplace should impose on others, like uh, okay, well, I need to train you in my wisdom and worldview. That seems I would not want to do that uh, to others with my most dearly held beliefs that I you know believe are the, like the most important things for civilization. I wouldn't want to force my coworkers to uh, sit through like a training that I design in them. Uh, on the other hand. I do think that there's um I do think that collegiality is a good thing and that uh, people at workplaces should be good to one another and if one of my coworkers said I really think you've got this wrong on any subject under the sun could you read this thing could you watch this video could you consume this thing I really would just you know I think maybe you'll see it a different way I would be happy to do that and I think that um you know a kind of posture of easygoing forbearance on all sides is a, a pretty healthy way to go forward. And like, we don't all have to be um, at odds all the time in culture war fights. And thankfully the Atlantic has never been that way. Like you're talking about high trust environments. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, on Twitter, it's like the way to end every debate is, well, I can't talk to you about this until you read these 17 books. that I'm recommending <laughs> to you. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Connor Friedersdorf is a staff writer at The Atlantic and runs the substack called Best of Journalism. His recent article in The Atlantic is called The DEI Industry Needs to Check Its Privilege, and it was published on May 31, 2023. Connor, thanks so much for being on the Colette Podcast. Thanks for having me.